right? Recording's on, sharing is on. So yeah, the, the plan today, uh, if there is a plan after all, uh, the usual quick discussion of uh, the latest Siebel uh, update 22.4 and um, Siebel Cloud Manager is quite the topic as well. So I want to include that. And then uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Miki Popescu, who has joined from Oracle Support. And she is going to talk a bit about the uh, analyzers, the Oracle Support analyzers. So some news there. We have been talking about these analyzers in previous Fridays. I'm glad to have, have Miki here. Um, and yeah, we have, also have uh, Brian and Kerry from Oracle here. Thanks for your time. And let's... Uh, and. Then we usually uh, go, go over into discussion, like like you know, uh, of uh, features and and things, all things Siebel. So twenty two point four um, April release uh, has feet, real features, as as the release notes uh, name them. Uh, web tools can now do validation, which is not new because it. It's in Siebel tools since since I can think of Siebel tools, but now it's in web tools, and there's a, a new or refurbished integration. Let's call it that with OIA Oracle Intelligent Advisor, formerly known as Policy Automation Oracle Policy Automation, and uh, the Test Automation Report has been refurbished as well. It's now available in a new HTML format as well as JSON format. So that's quite interesting too. And then if you if you skim through through the bookshelf, what's new chapters? Uh, we, you also see that rest the, in the rest guide. There's two new documented features, new new parameters for queries, and a pre post processing option. So there's there's going to be some some more information on that later. Then we have a TLS support for the ESD. The, beloved email sending daemon. Uh, and that daemon is, well, sending emails for Siebel marketing automation. Uh, then there is a bug fix that improves the Siebel server startup time to go back to normal, let's say. That's uh, one thing. And Tomcat got updated, I noted that. So uh, security-wise, with 22.4, you get the uh, a recent Tomcat version. So, if you uh, web, if you look into web tools, there's new menu items and buttons, and they say validate. So you can now, like you can do in Siebel tools, you can select objects of the same type, like applets or business components, or whatever, and you can run the validation. And you see on the screenshot, it's very similar to what Siebel tools provided uh, with all the rules being checked and the results being displayed. And you can you can set options to ignore some rules there. So that's that's like everybody of us has run the validation. Am, am I right? <laughs> uh, in Siebel tools. So you know how you know you know how that stuff works. Um, there's some new stuff there because uh, you can validate an entire workspace. So all objects that are modified in that version of the workspace that you selected. Uh, and it prompts you for the for the version, I think, as well. Do you want to validate this version only or validate the entire workspace? Of course, that can be lengthy if you have lots of things in the workspace. Um, but that's a nice feature there. And then there's batch validation, which is also not, not really new. You can validate the entire repository. Uh, you could do that with the Seep Dev executable, Siebel Tools executable, but now Seep Dev CLI also has a BV batch validate option. Works quite similar, so that's all documented there. There's a slight difference available now. Just FYI, um, in Web Tools, you can define which things you want valid batch validation to run. So you could say, I only want you to run the applet validation rules. 
Uh, okay, yeah, you have to go into web tools and go to the options and, and make, make right. you and select. So you can pick. So if you only want to deal with VizComps or whatever, right, right. Um, you could choose those rules. Or if you want to exclude rules to make it run faster, you can specify them up front and sort of say, here's what I want. And then uh, it'll save that somewhere. I don't remember the documentation. Type. And then you can, um, and then when you run batch validate, it'll only use those, it'll only check those rules. And I'm pretty sure with tools, you couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, it it saves it it saves us in, in the user preferences, right? And then you have to right user yeah, preference. Yeah, you have to run cpdev CLI with the correct CFG file, the SW. Right. There's a, because the the, I noted that with a customer file. recently. There's a SWT uh, SW tool CFG Siebel Web Tool CFG on the server, and and that seems to be functional because the customer started using it. And that has the correct settings to to read the user preferences from the Siebel web tools. So yeah, that's that's a nice uh, uh, a nice addition too. So you you can speed up the batch validation only validating the objects and rules that you want to do, and you it it honors your settings in web tools. Okay, great, great addition. So, how how many percent, uh, Brian? If you allow, how many percent are we towards one hundred percent parity? Uh, great, great question. Uh, that's a, that's an actually an interesting uh, thing to calculate. I'll look into it. <laughs> okay, so I uh, I can list features and check them off or not, but there's you know, if you wanted a level of effort, uh, that's that would be a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'm just kidding a little bit. So we are we are getting closer to 100% parity for sure. Uh, with the oh, just uh, FYI, we are working on the upgrade um, views, and we've gotten some feedback from a, a couple of uh, partners on um, things we could do to improve them, as opposed to just port them over. Uh, so the views you use for conflict resolution. So if anyone has any feedback on that, just you know, reach out to me and and uh, we can have a discussion okay. um, about things you think would improve it. I'm not talking about the upgrade itself, but the actual conflict resolution, the UI. Yeah. Okay. So those views that are yeah. now in Siebel tools for analyzing right. the merge. We're gonna we're gonna concept. provide that in Web Tools, and we've just started the initiative, but we're um, we want to see if we can improve it as opposed to just move it. Yeah. Okay. So again, reach, reach out to me separately. I don't want to derail your call yeah. any further if anyone's interested in talking mm -hmm. about it. Okay. Thanks for that. All right. So, and then there's a topic I cannot really talk about much. Um, I've intelligent advisors. So uh, you see here, does this logo that you see is not is not an Oracle logo? It's the logo of um, the company of uh, Richard Napier, who can't be here today. Um, but he has specialized in intelligent advisor with intelligentadvisor.com. And I invited him to talk about all the bells and whistles of this refurbished integration uh, in the next Siebel Friday. So just an announcement, um, but it is available in 22.4 with a lot of workflows, integration objects, VBCs, business services that the repository upgrade pumps into your, well, in the, the well-known established uh, process pumps into an integration workspace and in, then you can deliver it. So if you, not, not sure if a, maybe a question to the crowd, you, you can just shout out or use the chat. Uh, anyone using OIA or the predecessor uh, policy automation with Siebel? Is there any, any users here? Anyone? Okay, crickets. <laughs> so, I have one question I have actually. So here, uh, the repository upgrade. Uh, uh, so basically, the post install DB will cover the repository upgrade, right? Uh, no, it's a separate step. So for the twenty one dot four, okay, we need to execute that as well. Okay. Yeah, you need to run the. The repository upgrade is optional and you can run it from command line and it will create that integration workspace, add a developer workspace and all the artifacts will be there. So you can, well, inspect them, test them and then deliver. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, but again, on the, on the real functionality side of OIA, uh, we have 
my my partner on the Siebel Hub, Richard Napier, is the real, uh, yeah, the goat <laughs> for intelligent advisor, and he's gonna be at at the next Siebel Friday, hopefully. Okay, and also, uh, most most people who attend Siebel Friday frequently they know I'm I have a knack for test automation, and nobody's nobody in the crowd is using it actively, probably. But uh, here's the thing. Uh, that HTML report that gets uh, created when, when you do a unit test with DESA or you do a batch test with, with Jenkins plus DESA, then you get a, a load of HTML reports, which are, well, to be frank, a little bit dust, dusty. <laughs> uh, they have all the correct information for sure, but now the, the HTML report, as you can see from the screenshot, has been refurbished a bit more modernized, more interactive. And the the interesting thing is also that it generates a JSON file for each uh, test script with the outcome with of each step. And that JSON file, of course, can be used programmatically uh, with any software capable of analyzing it and um, yeah, putting it into a well, dashboard format or whatever, or analyzing it uh, in a Jenkins pipeline, etc. So there's a, a lot of use cases for that JSON output that is now delivered with the 22.4 test automation playback. Okay, any any notes here on test automation? No. All right, so new reporting capabilities there. Uh, then I, I dug a little bit into the uh, REST uh, enhancements. So not, not sure if it's just documented in 22.4 or has been really added. Uh, like there's, there's now two parameters in the documentation for GET requests, that, that is query. So for data and workspaces, uh, you can run queries. And execution mode, probably something that everybody in the room knows what execution mode is about. Uh, forward only or bidirectional. You you do it in eScript all the time. When you run a query, you hopefully set it to the correct value that you need. And forward only is supposed to, well, not, not really technically correct, but handle the query a bit faster and the uh, output is a record set that you can parse in one direction only. Forward, well, <laughs> that was easy. And if you use the default, when you're not set it, you have bidirectional, so you can parse the record set or iterate forward and backward. And in most of the use cases for REST, I would say, for REST queries, you wanna, well, so, um, provide an application with some list of, of Siebel records that it then processes. Um, yeah, forward only is probably the only thing you need. And now you can you can request it as a parameter. Good thing to know. And it seems like it might be a best practice to include that for most query requests, I would think, uh, regardless of record size. It, yes. Actually, so you get in here if you don't put something in there. A warning. Sorry, say again. The when you do your uh, uh, save, if the uh, query doesn't have um, something in the parents, it doesn't. It gives you a uh, something's missing. Issue. You, you mean write operations? Yeah. Yeah, but this is for read uh, query operations. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, you can't pass in an empty empty body into into a post. Yeah, well, or, or no no body. <laughs> you have to have an you have to have an empty body in the post request. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, and uh, then there's another query parameter just for read only. Uh, ex very lengthy but very <laughs> very uh, verbose name. Exclude empty fields in response. Well, now now you know what it does. So when you set it to, to yes or true or why, it will, the response body will not have the fields. It will not have it, the fields that are empty. That 
so that reduces the response body, which can be huge. If you, for example, don't specify the field names, you get all the 500 fields of the account business components in there. That's a, a lot uh, in, in terms of kilobytes or megabytes. And so you can reduce that. So that, that's also good to have. All right, so yeah, REST API gets a few updates here. Uh, and the, the second update for REST API is uh, the pre and post processing. Uh, that's documented as well in Bookshelf. Uh, so the gist is that you have to add user properties to this to the standard business service, EEI REST adapter service. So that's a business service in the in the back that runs in the background. That's it's kind of the proxy to EEI Siebel adapter. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that business service now supports user properties, will enable pre-post processing to true, will enable that feature. And then you can set triplets. Is that, that correct? Well, no, it doesn't have to be a triplet, but it can be. Um, at least, what, what's the, how do you say, two? <laughs> and triplets is three, what, what's two? Du, du, duplets? Double. Double, <laughs> two, two of them. Uh, a resource underscore followed by a sequential number. So the first, the, um, the first one can be like service slash asterisk or workflow or specifying the path pattern to apply the pre or post processing to. And then you specify for each sequential number, a pre-process or optional and or uh, post-process business service method separated by colon. And that works with all the inbound resources, data, service, workspace, workflow. Uh, I did a quick test. Uh, actually, I was curious and, and that, that's a question for me to maybe whoever might be able to, to answer it. Um, it seems to just invoke the method and does not pass any payload like our input arguments. So, is, so I wrote the wrapper service for EI XML write to file and wrote all the property sets out and they were, came out empty. Is that by design is just invoking the method and you have to get your input arguments someplace else or can it be used to pass input arguments to? Gary, I think that one's for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually don't know. Uh, Alex, if you could send me an email on that. Okay, I will. I, I'll do. Yeah, that I'll was just my it. observation I had. It's yeah, it invokes the method all right, uh, but mm -hmm. you, you can't seem to pass any input arguments or get any from the from the uh, calling service. So that, okay, I'll send you an email. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No problem. But that's it. That seems to be quite handy for the, the use case in Bookshelf is uh, reloading caches as a post-processing step, uh, which is, uh, of course, quite na a natural thing you want to do. Um, and then that's that's a really fresh slide I put together just yesterday. Um, I had a discussion with, uh, with Brian and, and Mark Ferrier. So Siebel Cloud Manager has been announced on the, on the uh, on the uh, Oracle Siebel CRM blog. So I'm showing you that here. So there's an article out there from April 25 that is public and Cloud Manager now is, uh, probably hand over to Brian right away, is a limited availability or is it generally available? available? But it's, it's out there now and uh, that's, that's a great day to, to have. And, it's, um, yep. it's there for the asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, on, um, so on it's okay, but it's there for the, but you still have to ask for it. And the reason is simply that we, we want to know who has it, you know, so yep. that it's easier for us to support it, but it's just, um, but yeah, basically anyone with an OCI tenancy can ask and we'll add you to the, we'll add your tenancy to the, um, to the private marketplace that will allow you to download. Okay, that's uh, that's great. There was a, there was a beta program, of course, and some of you might might have been part of the beta. And the the, the 
Beta program only applies to Siebel component services. Cloud Manager, we actually ended up skipping the beta. <laughs> Oh, so there, were, there, were, there never was a beta, okay. <laughs> no, no, we were planning it and it was just the, our internal red tape to get a beta going was taking forever. And we were like, well, it works. So let's just release it. <laughs> let's ship it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and of course there's lots and lots of things to learn and talk about. And this is just came in so, yeah, late, late in the month that I'm not really prepared to talk about it much, but uh, I think for next Siebel Fridays, there will be lots of uh, discussions around this utility. Uh, let me just quickly describe it. So in case some of you hear, hear it for the first time. So um, that is a utility that is a, an instance on OCI uh, called Siebel Cloud Manager. And it can do basically two things. The one thing is provide a lift utility, lift and shift utility. So you can take an on-premise environment and package it, put it into OCI object storage and then deploy it in OCI. So that's the lift and shift part with existing enter enterprises. And then there's a greenfield deployment option. So you can create a new enterprise and, uh, uh, and choose, for example, sample or vanilla database. And that's replacing the cloud marketplace image that, that existed with, uh, with Jenkins doing that same thing, you know, create an enterprise with sample or vanilla database. So not, not sure how, how, how far you got, Brian, with, with replacing that actually, but that's, that, that was the plan, right? And uh, also it, it employs uh, the principle of uh, GitLab stored configuration data. So that is uh, version controlled configuration data that is then applied to the Kubernetes cluster. So when you manage your enterprise, when you set parameters, create component definitions, you create a YAML file or update it and uh, flux and Helm and Kubernetes will apply it automatically to the target enterprise. So that's a really, gr yeah, groundbreaking um, cloud technology that's now entering the the scene here. And that's it's very, all very interesting. I'm getting very excited here. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but it's really fresh. And so let's see how how this evolves. And thanks for the for the Siebel team to put that together. Okay, any any comments there? Any anything about Cloud Manager? No, not really. Okay. Okay, and that's uh, yeah, that's the the update part. So now I will I will hand over to Mickey for you, uh, for an update on uh, the Oracle support analyzers. So I'll stop sharing. So, or you? Okay. Yeah, Is sharing. my Ready? screen visible? Yes. Yeah. There you okay. go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex, for your introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Mickey. And I work in uh, core technologies areas in uh, Siebel support. Muted. Um, so for the past year, we were looking to find ways to monitor Siebel systems. And we, we came along this solution called Siebel Analyzers. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you had the chance to test them. So. Um, Today I'm making a wide introduction in the in the topic. Uh, so, what started this automation discussion was to to be ahead of the curve and provide a way to monitor our Zibol modules, uh, workflow, loyalty, system administration, and so on and so forth. And we spend the time to to transform the knowledge learned from top priority service requests that we have worked on over the, the past years 
in order to extract valuable information so that we can do this monitoring solution and we came up we came across a solution that would basically run health checks against your zebel environment primarily these are sql queries but we enhance them to be also java or python scripts uh they would provide an analysis on the current environment in a friendly manner in a html format and additionally will provide recommendations and troubleshooting notes in order for you to be able to to self-serve so as i said in zibble support we ran into a lot of priority ones for this request and most of these analyzers were created as a conclusion from a severity one SR log by any customer. And we all know how complex a Zeeble environment can get by adding servers, increased performance, uh, get high availability. And I think this solution brings uh, simplification as it allows easier understanding and management of potential issues that might occur and provides also the, the troubleshooting steps. So we spent the time to, to review the most common issues met and created uh, the Zeeble monitoring units, which is a separate service for customers that are on Oracle Managed Cloud service. And basically we built this analyzer framework and delivered on my Oracle support for free, the Zeeble analyzers. So they are available on my Oracle support. Uh, these are the available analyzers at the moment. Um, we are planning on enhancing the existing ones rather than creating new ones, but uh, <laughs> you never know, to be, to be honest. And this is the sample output you would get from running uh, one of the, the analyzers. So it's very friendly. Everyone can run it and check the, the checkpoints uh, checked by the, the utility. Um, also, here is the, the flow. You may uh, try to, to download the analyzer from the a document on my Oracle support, choose the analyzer of choice and then download it and place it on your environment. Then it would require some special setup, which is also available in the document where you download it. And you simply run it from the, the command line. Yeah, so uh, that's pretty much it. And to, to conclude this short uh, presentation, I would like to, to highlight the key points of running uh, the analyzers against your systems. Basically, it, it is an opportunity uh, as we are continuously working on adding more valuable scripts. Uh, there is no additional cost for this type of monitoring and also, uh you you can query the the output and the sql queries or code based sample scripts that scans your environment before running the actual analyzer so it might give you ideas on maybe internal automations you can build and also the the results are delivered in a in a friendly manner so since now, I think these type of solutions were available only for customers that would use Zeeble in an Oracle managed cloud system. But now we, we were able to, to provide these on-premise and free of charge. And uh, I, I think it's a good opportunity at least to, to test them and share with us how you, how you feel about them, what should be added, if they bring value and so on. So uh, if any of you 
have already uh, tested them, if you have some feedback, I would be more than glad to, to hear it from, from you. Yeah, this is Nick. I've run it against all my environments, and it's, okay. it's pretty nice. Uh, I did have one when we were doing the configuration, is because unmuted repository, I guess, is all mucked up, and mm -hmm. you have issues with duplicate records in the repository somehow. So I got to take it out there. There's, we're still working on trying to figure that out. Oh, okay. But otherwise, I mean, all the other stuff is really, really helpful. That's good to know. Report's Alex has cool uh, already tested them. Right, Alex? Uh, yeah, so so thank, thanks, Mickey. Uh, thanks very much for, for giving us the uh, overview of the analyzers. And there's also a, a video playback available on, of the last um, Oracle support uh what do you call it um advisor webcasts yeah yeah <laughs> yeah advisor. Uh, and what i'm showing on the screen right now is a uh, one of one of two blog posts on the analyzers you find on the siebel hub so uh, i'll just paste that uh url in the chat so you, so you can grab it from the chat and uh, that that details out running it on windows it's very similar on linux um, and the, the recent version has added a lot of uh, environment variables that you need to yeah. set in, a, in addition to the table. Uh, it was it was called Sapmin in the first versions, but now it's Siebel underscore table owner. Uh, so it connects to the database using that information. And then it connects at least the system analyzer. Correct me. If yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, Only the system admin analyzer is now yeah. capable of connecting to to the zookeeper itself and uh, query yeah. information from there. Yeah. So this is why we need so much details. Yeah. It goes through, to, through, to through the gateway. Connect. But if, if you don't provide them, it will simply skip the uh, okay. So it's, Java and Python scripts and will run only the query. So you are good to go. It's anyway. a clever little fellow, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's a, sa a sample script you can put together on Windows to, to set all these environment variables in the shell and then run it. Uh, and that there's a sample output here. Sorry for the blur, uh, but that's the HTML output. And okay, so. Oh, a caveat to the Linux world. Uh, Red Hat 7 only supports Python 2, oh, okay. not Python 3. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So that's the caveat there. So, yeah, you need Python for several test scripts, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Python 3, it says in the documentation, yeah, okay. All, All right. right. And they won't install Python 3 on my Linux servers. We're running Red Hat 7.9. Oh, that's interesting. I see. Is that a limitation of, well, not Red Hat, but your environment? Yeah, uh, they said, uh, they told me that Red Hat does not support Python 3 on 7.9. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, so that's good. my support team. They may just be blowing smoke. <laughs> If they say so, <laughs> yeah. okay. But um, all right. So yeah, that's a support analyzers ongoing topic here, and um, yeah, do do check them out. Uh, uh, and the next next part here, let me check my notes real quick. Is uh, yeah, talk about the blog a little bit more. Siebel Hub blog that is, and other blogs. Um, uh, as you see on the screenshot, there's the Siebel Hub blog still going strong uh, and happy to well post articles on a regular basis and recently got some help from other people who also started blogging and providing information. Sorry, I just have to locate that. Here's, here's one blog in particular by uh, Rahul, Siebel Foundation which uh, if, you, if you Google for Siebel CRM blogs, you find plenty of blogs, which are honestly speaking quite stale. 
la last entry was made in like 2012 or 15. <laughs> it might not be current, but, but uh, this one I can recommend and it's uh, also been featured on the Siebel Hub. So Rahul has a lot of great content here uh, on the SiebelFoundations.com. So I'll put that in the chat for you. And then we have, um, yeah, I'll just go through the recent blog posts a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a mix, of course, of information. This one here is uh, regarding our new um, way of providing training on the Siebel Hub. You know, Siebel Hub is one of the premium Siebel CRM training providers. Uh, we, we, that's Richard and me, recorded a lot of training videos, which we made available mod on a modular basis. So you can, down you can access the individual videos for, for a small fee and get the, the course materials. But now we pull them together into a full offering. So you, you pay once, a bit higher fee, of course, but you get all the modules and all the course materials. So you don't have to kind of sift through the three Siebel Hub shop and see what's there or find out yourself. Uh, you have a full, a full course. And we started with the Siebel 22 workshop. Uh, that's uh, the what's new workshop, if, if you will where you get all the information about architecture, integration, installation, Siebel web tools on an always up-to-date basis. So all the course materials is always available for the latest version, including videos on YouTube, which augment, for example, for 22.4. And, and we started with that Siebel 22 workshop. You see it's special price, it's very attractive. Uh, we have a very new training, Siebel integration. So Siebel integration for the 21st century, let's call it that. Uh, and then we have OpenUI basics and OpenUI professional full training with all the course materials. So that's a new way of purchasing training on the Siebel Hub. It's video training, so you can, after purchase, you can access it immediately, get started. So please, yeah, spread the word and uh, use that. So that's also featured in the blog here. We have that. Just bear with me as I, okay, sorry for that. I have to go down actually. So, and yeah, talking about guests and uh, people who also share uh, knowledge on, on Siebel CRM. Uh, we recently have two blog posts, guest, guest posts from uh, Jose Luis, uh, who works for a German company. And he has added two articles. Uh, the latest one is on using uh, custom shortcuts, using a, open, using a JavaScript library. So for example, he, his users can press a uh, shortcut combination Alt F3, which adds a username and timestamp combination if the cursor is in a text area. So very nice feature and he he describes how to do that. And there's also uh, the source code is available on GitHub. So thanks very much to Jose Luis, who is a family man. He's not available on Friday afternoons, but thanks to him. And then yeah, we, there's another article, bear with me. Yeah, the second article from Jose Luis that you find on, on the Siebel Hub blog is on limiting user sessions. So that's a very interesting topic. So um, Jose Luis calls them Nirvana sessions when your users just don't close, the, don't log out, they just close the browser <laughs> or the tab and your, the Siebel session goes on on the server as we all know and that, that could be a pain. And his solution actually queries the task history table and shows a pop-up to the user if they exceed a certain threshold of open sessions, tells them, okay, you have more than two or more than three, four sessions open. Do you wanna proceed and close the log out of the oldest session and use, and, and use this one or you will cancel and log out of this session? So very nice example how to, well, help users <laughs> close their sessions. 
So it's all explained in the blog post. I won't go into details uh, along with the uh, sample code on, on GitHub as well. So great stuff there. So make sure you, you check it out. And uh, Kerry uh, has asked me to to uh, do a poll. Um, I, I have some news on polls as well, but Kerry uh, asked me to do a poll. Kerry, do you have do you have anything on that? Oh, what I wanted to do is ask the group a question, Des describe a feature, and ask them their thoughts on it. Okay, so it's not so much a poll; it's a yeah, question. it's kind yeah. of an open forum question. Okay, yeah, shoot. Oh, okay, all right. So we have a, a feature planned that allows your REST calls to create a dynamic integration object. So if you've not used integration objects before, the way that we do it now is you create a workspace and go through the wizard that creates an integration object with all of its related integration components. And we have historically called them base IOs. And no, no reason for that now, but that's that's how they're, you may recognize them by that term. But if you don't have a base IO, then you want to query from a REST call some business object that was not created as a an integration object and delivered to the end production environment. This allows you to just say, hey, I want to query the uh, the contact business component. Let's say there's no business uh, object and there's no base contact integration object already there. It creates it as an XSD file and then you can query that data. So there was no base IO created or delivered to production. It simply um, queries the current configuration of that business object and its children, creates a dynamic business or integration object and you're allowed to use it then. So it's, it takes about I don't know, one or two minutes the first time that it has to go through and figure it all out and write the XSD on the server. And, uh, but it, there's no need for someone to create that integration object in tools and deliver it as a workspace object unless they want to do that. So what it does first is it says, hey, does one already exist with this name? If so, we're going to use it. Otherwise, create it, and then you can use it. Does uh, anyone think that's a good idea, something they would use? Uh, it sounds really interesting, Brian. Or, what, oh, I'm sorry, was that Carrie? Sorry. Yeah. Carrie. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no. Um, Figure it out. Yeah, because what we end up doing is creating roughly a one for one design time version in the repository between every business component that we want to expose as a service. Um, and, you know, having that flexibility sounds pretty appealing. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that would happen is, let's say that in the meantime, someone has, after you've already created this dynamic integration object on contact, but since that was created, someone has gone in and adjusted the contact business component and delivered that to production or test, whatever. Mm -hmm. It will read the new, that definition and say, okay, it's been changed since we last looked at it and it will regenerate. So you'll always get the latest version of what's been delivered. The question here is uh, mainly on governance. And we don't want necessarily, because when you go into the user interface, we may have restricted the views that a user can see. They, they can't see the quote screens for some reason for that particular responsibility or position user. And we want to continue that. We don't want them to create a dynamic uh, integration object on quote if they're not authorized to use it. So the governance here would be on a screen that an administrator would just choose a particular business object and click allow dynamic creation of an IO. Do you feel that's sufficient? It's, it's definitely a simple way to do it. I think, uh, this Nick, I think that plus the responsibilities that we use for the REST services type concept, might be a good way to do that. Yeah, that right way, now, not the, only the business object or component, but also 
limited to certain responsibilities than users yeah. who have responsibility? Uh, yeah, okay. like we have, uh, we have business service access, we have that, we mm -hmm. have business process access, or workflow processes. Uh, why not have business object access? Yes. That's similar for you, you, based on responsibility and, and maybe even, I'm thinking out loud, <laughs> maybe even uh, going down to the business component level, you know, like yeah. business services is on the method level. Mm -hmm. uh, business object could be business component level or even well, even fields if you want, <laughs> but that that's a bit overkill. Uh, so def definitely sounds sounds like a also my opinion on that. It sounds very hot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the appeal of uh, the inbound breast is how quick it is to turn something around for uh, the, the consumer requesting that kind of data or that, that functionality, and this would just further add to that that business case. I think that's really exciting. Yeah, it doesn't preclude the development team from creating this integration object and restricting how it how they want it to be. So they don't want 30 of these business components exposed. That's still possible. This is just for, mm -hmm. hey, nobody's done that yet in this particular workspace. So we're going to create one. Yeah, I can see that for a lot of the, I use CTMS and there's not always the integration that I'm just going to need or want or can use. I have to create them manually. Uh, right. Okay, good. That, that, that's all I want to know. Thank you for your time. All right, very exciting. Thanks, Kerry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Kerry. And uh, good to hear that. that and good to see or witness that the uh, Siebel Friday is, a, is a, a platform, a forum for discussing these kinds of things with between Oracle and the customers. So that's a good thing to see. And hopefully this comes to fruition soon. All right. Yeah, so We have it targeted for later this year, but who knows? Okay, later this year just sounds about right. <laughs> In the future. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah. One one more thing. Well, Kerry, uh, your poll was more a, a one one question thing, but you know, you all know polls, and uh, you you know that we have several polls out there on the Siebel Hub YouTube channel. I've just opened them, and there, there's no new one. I I might I might put a new one out there soon, or maybe just yeah, just an idea that. Uh, is is growing on me. Maybe work together with Kerry to put out the poll on the late on on some features that people want to see. Uh, but yeah, be reminded that if you haven't taken part in in those polls on the YouTube channel, uh, the link is in your chat. And I want to highlight one of them uh, that I posted after the last Siebel Friday. Uh, it's about continuous releases. Uh, how often do you update? Siebel CRM with, with the latest update. And uh, there were 19 votes so far, so far from being uh, representative, but it's a nice uh, nice amount still. And 5%, so that sounds like one or two people, or one, one uh, actually, uh, even check the monthly um, question or answer. So, there is there are projects out there that update Siebel every month with the monthly update. Uh, most of them, as expected, go every two to six months. So customers are, of course, not required, as you know, to to update every month. So it's cumulative, and that that's of course good. So two two times per year, more or less, and then there's like twenty a quarter of the people who responded is are in once per year which is something I witness with customers a lot. So usually when they make the decision, take their time, <laughs> uh, then, then a year has elapsed already before they apply the next update. And then there's a fact, fraction only when we have to, like security reasons, like the Log4J uh, vulnerability last year. Um, and there's, well, the, the, 
the troll trap is here. Uh, never re-update, never. Well, uh, that is, of course, some people do that. So that that's an interesting uh, response. I, I see a lot, especially those two to six months time frame seems very fast to me. And I would like to ask you or uh, Brian and Kerry also, what, what do you think about these results? Are are they matching your what you see with Siebel customers? You know, <laughs> um, I'm not really up on the frequency that yeah. that people update, so I couldn't answer that. I I think this is this looks pretty consistent with my um, observations. Um, you know, I, I think personally, the sweet spot's probably about three to four months, um, you know, just a, as a balance of staying current, which is, you know, critical due to the security fixes um, that go into almost every release. Um, but at the same time, balancing out the level of effort involved, um, you know, the, the danger in the only when we have to um, situation is, you know, if you're sitting on 20.3, and or whatever, and a log 4J type of problem arises, you know, now you need to apply 22.1 and you've basically got two years mm -hmm. of changes in the application. And so the amount of testing or the potential for that to disrupt your, your customizations becomes much larger than if you were doing it every three or four months. Um, so the, the, you know, the percentage of, of potential issues drops significantly if you do it more regularly. So. You know, I mean, I know people have budgets and they have challenges and, and on and on, but, um, uh, you know, again, to, personally, I think the sweet spot's about every three to four months. Yeah. Okay. So pretty consistent. So that those YouTube, those haphazard YouTube polls that I do seem to be consistent with the larger, with the larger public. That's, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, again, um, feel, feel free to share the link uh, and uh, have people vote on on these polls. Uh, might be a new one out soon. And if you have any ideas or any any ideas for polls, uh, yeah, drop me a note and we'll set one up really quick. And the, the last poll I, I'll <laughs> uh, bug you with is the uh, ongoing poll on the Siebel Hub. It's a different different URL. Uh, share that in the chat, and that's a poll on which trainings would you like to see us publishing uh, in the future. Um, yeah, uh, spoiler alert: we're already working on on actually three of them: <laughs> order management, product pricing, administration. Pretty. Um, yeah, amazing and powerful and often used modules. Um, but if you if you say, okay, I want to see some training offerings on the Siebel Hub regarding a specific module, there's a box you can you can use to type it in if it's not in the list. All right, yeah, and uh, that's it from my side. So, any rooms open for question as always? all the time. So if you have any anything, put it in the chat. Shout out. Okay, no, no questions there. No comments. Final words. All right, then, uh, yeah, th thank, you, thank you very much for um, yeah, being part of this Siebel Friday and for joining. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Brian Carey and Mickey from Oracle for taking the time to, to join here and uh, share their insights and wisdom. Um, yeah, hope, you s hope to see you on the next Siebel Friday. Yeah? Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Thank you, Alex. <laughs>